Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is perhaps India's best known, internationally acknowledged, renowned photographer. Uh, he's published in the magazines of the world, Time, Life, Geo, Parimak. He's been photo editor of India today for many years, a photographer with the Statesman. He's had a long and distinguished career. I'm delighted to welcome Raghu Rai. Raghu, you have been doing photographs for more than, I don't know, 35 years. And uh, this is a very personal moment for me because uh, starting out my own career uh, and work in the media, I have learned a great deal uh, at your, well, almost at your feet uh, when you were working uh, with the Statesman uh, in, a, in, a, in a small dark room. Uh, from that time in, in the 60s, uh, technology has changed so much. Uh, in what ways has it impacted your work? You now have a situation where someone shoots on a digital camera and you often don't see the result till it's printed in a publication. In what ways has it changed your approach to work? Well, basically, I think you know, it has made life easier for us, technically. You don't have to worry about setting the exposure, winding the film, even focusing the situation. Not that I use autofocus business. But uh, by and large, it has become so easy that you set your camera on auto exposure and you just go on clicking, you know, the kind of work I do, I'm a street photographer, mm -hmm. I deal with life, the human energy, you know, the movement. And if you can't be quick, you, you, you miss the moment. So that way things have advanced a lot. You know. But also simultaneously, the approach, the form, the style, everything has also changed a lot. You know, you know you've described yourself as a street photographer that gives the impression that someone who's a sort of going around clicking and capturing moments. And I think the sort of what has been the very distinguished quality of your work is that not only have you captured uh, sort of you know, the dramatic, enduring moments from history, but uh, the everyday moments that portend to history. Uh, you have recently done a, a, a remarkable book on something that seemed as prosaic as steel. Uh, and, and, and your work has this, has this very uh, sculpted quality. Uh, you work with tones, you work with light, and yet it all seems to happen in your role as a street photographer, where you just seem to be working so quickly. How do the two reconcile? No, why I said street photographer, because eventually, for my personal work, I love to be in ordinary daily life situations. As far as photojournalism is concerned, you know, one has been to big occasions, big disasters and those kind of situations which have their own potentiality where there's so much happening right in front of you and but those kind of moments you know they are valid today for tomorrow's newspaper and the next day nobody bothers about them but daily happenings of ordinary daily life they have the human you know kind of power about them you know, which you can never you know the place of forget. You know. Some rare moments of life have greater potency and they can stay alive and they can live longer basically you know, in your mind, in your you know, world where you deal with you. How often are you uh, surprised uh, with the contact sheet or elements uh, in it? No, not, not the content, uh, contact sheet you're talking about. No, you see, the life has surprises all the time. You know. If you are, you make yourself available in, and then, you know, from your, you know, first of all, it's very conscious that you pick up a camera, you go in the street or you go in a big situation and you are ready with your exposure, with your right lens and you're trying to take pictures. But through concentration, there comes a meditative moment you know, when nature, when life reveals its own mysteries. And those are the surprises. Those are the magic moments, which happen sometimes, not all the time, because all the time you're not so fresh, clean, and ready, and available to the situation, 100% you know, to receive and perceive, you know, in a way that we can respond instantaneously. It also meant that uh, to what degree is there a gap between conception, between the moment as you see it, and you click the shutter, and then you actually look at the material that comes out, 
you sometimes say it's different to what the mind's eye uh, and the physical eye had seen at the moment of clicking the shutter? Many times that happens, you know. You also, you see, as I said, that sometimes it, it happen, happens instantaneously, that your experience, your realization and your click, they happen simultaneously. And sometimes, you know, maybe you are not 100% there for some reason. And by the time you realize what it was, it's gone. And what you clicked, the next best moment. And when you come home and look at the contact sheet or the prints, well, you say, it is good, but... That fraction of a second before or after yeah, may have been that's, decisive. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in fact, you know, that discipline is so precious that not only clicking at the right moment you know, when you are moving in a situation, <clears throat> the space between you and what you are photographing, the sanctity of that space, it's so precious that one little step extra, one little step less, will never give you the same space and experience. Even if you click, click it at the right moment, and if you can't put it in the space required for that moment, you know? But to, to what degree do you then manipulate that frame after the moment? You know, when you go you, down and you, you make a print? You, you can't you, uh, say manipulate. You can recompose it in the sense maybe you feel you know that you were a little too far away and you have so much extra which is not required. But then, you see, the, diff the problem with creativity is and the magic of creativity is that you can really, when you look at other people's work or your own, of course you know what, how you shot the situation. But even when you look at other people's photographs, you can know exactly, instinctively, whether the person who's photographed this space, and there are so many elements, out of these elements, how many elements was he in touch with? How much space did he realize in that moment? How much is extra? Or what has he done with the space after clicking the picture? You see, I mean, that fine tuning tells you everything. That you can know exactly that this man who's photographed these four elements in a situation, he realized only two or three he was in touch with. The fourth one was just there because they will not connect completely somehow. I don't know whether it's the magic of human energy responding, you know and getting the vibrations back in one one moment where you say, wow, mm -hmm. this is it. In that sort of uh, mm -hmm. moment, uh, you know, there is, of course, the composition. But that, that, that composition and the visual impact is controlled by things like uh, aperture, depth of field, what you focus on. So there are these many elements uh, that precede the shutter, in a sense. Sure. So uh, how do you prepare for that moment in, in, in setting all these up. See, now, luckily in black and white photography, even if you are underexposing or overexposing because you don't have time to adjust or whatever, it doesn't matter very much. But in color photography, technically, you have to be precise because in black and white, when you take a picture, your photo negative is underexposed or say overexposed. When you are making a print, you can make a difference. You can control the tone and contrast. So when you're doing a color picture, that is your final click. That is your final print, technically. These days, the scanners, the computers can help you a bit. But then people like us who've been doing certain kind of photography with certain kind of sensitivity or purity or responsibility, you know, it becomes a little messing around you know, trying to take technical help. But again, I, I will also not say that taking technical help from scanners or whatever is a bad thing. As long as you can retrieve the image, it can help you. But then, this is, this is what the discipline is all about. You know, simultaneously things, you know, that your exposure, your mind, your body, your spirit, your everything moves, you know, in one click. Well, let's go back a little bit in time. It's sort of the mid-60s, and you joined the Hindustan Times as a photographer. Uh, why did you choose 
to become a photographer? How did it happen? Why did it happen? What drew you to the potentialities of it? It was by sheer accident, actually. Because basically, you know, my father wanted me to become an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I did civil engineering and worked with the government. I didn't like the job. Came back to Delhi from Punjab. Mm -hmm. That's where my father was. So came back to Delhi, stayed with my elder brother, S. Paul. He's a photographer. Photographer. <laughs> and a mad photographer. All photographers will come to him, share their pictures, share their ideas, and get very excited. And I used to sit and watch and think, you know, really crazy lot, you know. They're so excited, you know, that all, every time that somebody brings up a show, wow, you know, what, what an image you've created. And then the whole day will be spent discussing that. So one day, you know, just out of frustration, I was doing nothing. So I said, give me a camera. I'd you know, like to take some pictures. And my brother's friend, who lives uh, near Rohtak, he had a big farm. He was going there, you know, for a few days. I said, okay, let me go, you know, I'll take a camera and just take pictures for fun sake. And I went with him. I was there with him for three days in his village. And here I found a baby donkey, very cute looking. And I wanted to take a picture. I had an ordinary camera. And the donkey will move away, that baby. So I started chasing the baby donkey. And the baby donkey ran, and I ran after it. And the whole village was watching and laughing about it. <laughs> uh -huh. But I was just doing it for fun. And eventually, the baby donkey got tired mm -hmm. and stood like a rock because it was completely exhausted. So I took a picture with that ordinary camera innocent little baby donkey standing in that landscape, which was published in London Times. So the first photograph yeah. from the first <laughs> of film you shot is published in the London yes. Times. Uh -huh. And my brother was excited, and I was excited. I said, my God, that makes some sense. <laughs> you know. So this is how, you know, then I started you know, taking pictures every day. You know. And then I discovered, you know, each time I picked up the camera, I could take a close look at things, you know, which otherwise I was not able to do. You know. I was shy or I didn't know what to look for. You know. So as, you know, this instrument came closer to my eyes, maybe my energies, my mind, my body, they started responding to life more closely than I would have done otherwise. How difficult was it or, or, or uh, challenging for, uh, was it for you to come to, to grips with the, the technology of it? Uh, as we, we discussed, it, it isn't just merely capturing the moment of the image, but, but working on developing that uh, aspect of it. Uh, because in some ways, uh, photography is, um, is both sort of art, a technique, and technology. Uh, you know, not all art forms are that way, in a yeah. sense. No, I must say that. Basically, I have been pretty careless you know, about the technical aspect of photography. But um, if you look at it, you know, you have the speed of the film that you know. Then you have the aperture and the shutter speed, just these two things. You know. And, you know, it might sound very difficult for a layman, but beyond a point, you know, you're dealing with only you know, the shutter speed and the aperture. So, you know, in those days when you didn't have auto exposure cameras, you were trying to be a little careful, even if some picture was underexposed or overexposed. And also, if you are very, very conscious of everything, creativity doesn't happen. Sometimes even under, because your photograph got overexposed, it has created its own kind of grain in the photograph which normally you won't do that, you know. And uh, even if you did a click, you know, with a jerk because you didn't have time to wait, you know, and that jerk adds the kind of spontaneity in the frame. So, you know, all these things come into play, you know, somehow or the other. But these days, everything is almost ready-made. You know, you have to wait for the right moment and so Well, the reason I ask that question is because that what, what always struck me, and I learned from your work, uh, was the fact that uh, you you were perhaps the first photographer uh, whose work, when published in, in newspapers and magazines, uh, managed to retain a very special feeling of texture and tone. And so it, 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 it seemed obvious that here was a photographer who wasn't just clicking a picture, 
and then surrendering it to the production process. But uh, within the limitations of the way a magazine is published, your photographs work with black and white and grayscale and tones. Yeah, you see, that was also, you know, because just to shoot a good picture and leave it on the desk for the editors to, you know, do anything with it was not my kind of style. You know, because it was very important that if I try to talk to the editor or the news editor and get good space my photograph, then I'll go to the printers, you know, the block makers at that time, you know, the letterpress printing, and make sure that they have done a good block of my photograph. And usually what I'll do was, I would do was that make a little more contrasty print where the blacks are rich because in a newspaper or a magazine, black will never print 100% black. So if your blacks are not strong in your photograph, in your original print, you can imagine, you know, by the time they are printed in a newspaper, it will be totally green. So rich blacks, within those rich blacks, there have to be very nice highlights because the white will also not remain white. So to create that balance, you know, that I had learned sitting with the printers, with the block makers, and to the extent the kind of paper. What has been your relationship with the people and situations that you photograph? Because in the sense that the photographer becomes a presence, uh, could sometimes be an invasion of privacy, uh, intruding into someone's private space and making that public. Um, you know, there is a great deal of uh, discussion and debate about this. Uh, how have you handled this dilemma? Now, I'll give you a very nice example when I was photographing Mother, Mother Teresa. And, you know, I was photographing her for the last few days and she said, okay, tomorrow you don't come, Raju, because tomorrow is the Easter day. I'll be in prayers. And I don't want anyone to be, you know, clicking away and disturbing. Because usually we have the habit of, you know, jumping around and taking pictures. So I was devastated. I said, oh my God, you know, Mother, you know, in prayers, and I can't photograph that. So I looked at mother and I said, mother, you say you serve the poorest of the poor in the name of that Lord and also the fact that when he was suffering, you were not there to serve him. Now, when you serve these people, you think you are serving him and you are nursing him. She says, yes. I said, I have never met him. I have never seen him. But when you sit in prayers, I see him landing in your eyes. And I am here to photograph and share who mother is to us. And if you don't let me photograph this experience, you know, it will not be a complete story for me. So she looked at me, she said, okay, you come tomorrow, but you sit at one place. You will not move. That's a promise? I said, yes. So next day I come early in the morning, mother makes me sit on one side. And I'm, she's sitting here, I'm sitting on, on the side. And after a while, mother goes into meditation. Now, unless you see a full face, uh -huh. you know, you can't show that intensity. Right. My promise was, I shall not move. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that too with Mother Teresa, who has been the most precious sure. human being for me. Sure. You know, and I waited and waited and I, I couldn't wait anymore. I got up, went in front of the mother, took many pictures, uh -huh. came back. After a while, you know, when the prayers were over, mother was, you know, the sisters were going to kiss the feet of the Christ, there was a statue and then move out. Mother also got up. And that was about 30 feet away from where we were sitting. And I, said, oh my God. I have to get up again. <laughs> and then mother got up, she started moving, I got up, I took the picture. And mother did her part of the prayer and kissing. And she came out from the other room. And everything was over. And I also came out from, the, from different doors. You know. And now I was so guilty and I was so <laughs> sad within. You know, I said, oh my God, what do I do now? So, you know, I saw Mother coming. I stood like this. I said, Mother, forgive me. I pointed my finger. She said, oh, God has given you this assignment. You must do it right. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is a kind of blessing that only, I mean, such few great people can bless you with these kind of fulfillment and richness, you know. But then when you're doing something very sincerely and honestly, you need nature's blessing to support you. 
That's so, all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so it really is the motive with which you approach this uh, and approach your work that is critical. Um, in, 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 in the West, um, it, it, it took many decades for uh, photography to be really uh, recognized and acknowledged as art. You know, it was just seen as a, as a technical plaything. Uh, and in some cases, it's, it's, it's only recently that it has begun to figure in galleries and has found its place as an art form. And you have frequently described in our conversation you know, the processes of creativity and art and what have you. What is it that makes photography art in that sense? No, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a little. You know, that when photography started in 1850s, you know, the, technically things were very limited. You, know. you couldn't get pictures of a moving object. You know. And even when you had to do portraits, you had to made, make people sit you know, without breathing for a, a few seconds or moments, you know, so that the pic, uh, portrait was sharp. You know. Even with those limitations, Mostly, the photographers were trying to imitate the painters you know, in some way or the other. And uh, if you see some of the old portraits and nudes done by various photographers, they are in the same style of painting, you know, which was happening in Europe at that period. You know. But today, I can tell you there are so many painters who do their works, they look like photographs. They are following the photographer you know, some way or the other. You know. But the fact remains that <coughs> you see the, the creative aspect in photography is the, the fact that you are dealing with a reality which is there in front of you. And as the world is changing, you know, our minds, our attitudes, our styles, everything is changing, you know. And you see, when you see a creative, great image done at the right time in the right space, you know, you, when you see it a hundred years ago, maybe you'll say, oh my God, that's the way we used to be. Now, there's a great painting of that period, but still it's a product of your mind. Eventually, your hand has done it, you know, and you can maybe mix three centuries in a painting you know, and come up with the theme, you know, or you can paint the sky red. You know. And nobody can question you. But a photograph which captures the truth of that time in a most sensitive way will have its own strength and energy and will make you realize that's the way we used to be. And no, no, nothing else can replace photography today, you know, the potency of it. You know. you know, you've mentioned the photograph of the first donkey, you've mentioned uh, Mother Teresa. What has been sort of the most um, a difficult, challenging moment, uh, assignment uh, with, that, that you have been? No, you see, in journalism, there are many difficult moments also, but they come and go, you know, and one knows how to respond to certain situations. Sometimes you fail also, it doesn't matter, you know, you can't go beyond. What has been a moment of failure that you feel that, a moment that you could have captured and missed because the camera came out too slow or... Uh, I remember, you know, I was photographing Mrs. Gandhi in 70, 71, we were doing a day with Indira Gandhi when she was very popular and we all loved her. You know. So, you know, I went to her house in the morning around 8 o'clock when she got ready. So, you know, she was sitting with Rahul and Priyanka, you know, Rahul also, yes, and having breakfast, I photographed that, which is very personal moment, you know, normally you can't get these kind of pictures here in India. And then she started meeting people in the morning, the morning darshans. I took those pictures. I went to her office, spent more than half the day with her, you know, with various, through various meetings and you know, with politicians and bureaucrats. And around 5 o'clock, Mrs. Gandhi said, maybe now you should have a break and come home around 6.37 because what I'll be going doing now won't mean anything to you. I said, fine. So, at 7 o'clock, I reached Mrs. Gandhi's house. And Mrs. You know, the, at the reception, after a few minutes, they said, yes, please go in. And uh, she said, send him on to her study. And me, like a fool, two cameras hanging in my camera bag, you know, I'm walking carelessly through the corridor. 
towards her study. And suddenly I see Mrs. Gandhi by that time, by 7, 7.30, she was so exhausted. She was standing like this, holding a door, almost hanging like this. By the time I picked up the camera. <laughs> what a moment to lose. <laughs> and she, you know, she knew, you know, uh -huh. what I was trying to photograph. Uh -huh. so she, <laughs> uh -huh. Well, Raghu, thank you very much. And we look forward to sort of being woken up repeatedly by your work. Thank you.